this, you know, you knock it down, it's bottom weight, and it kind of comes up, right? So when I was in sales decades ago, now I'm dating myself even more, um, we used to joke that we were basically those clown toys. You gotta be able to get knocked down a ton of times and keep bouncing back every single time. In fact, you gotta be a little bit psychotic because you actually, I mean, by the way, most salespeople are actually on meds. Um, I mean, the good ones. They're, they're like, they're all ADD, right? Um, and so, say, ah, out of the next one. Yeah, here we go. Okay, this is gonna, it's not that one. Okay, here we go over here. Um, in a good way. In a good way, yeah. And by the way, <laughs> have you noticed how fast I talk? Um, so, <laughs> Um, the, the point is you have to be willing to get shot down and come back and do it again. And literally you have to wake up every day going like, okay, you don't even realize and think about, I got shot down yesterday. It's like, today's going to be the day. We're going to go try it and it's going to work, right? And the next day you wake up and today's going to be the day, right? And every day it's Groundhog Day until a few of them actually hit. So you actually have to be ready for that and go through that process. So there are ways to get around cold calling. Okay, sorry, that's me telling me I got to get done here. Um, I'm, all, I'm about to wrap up. Um, so there are things you can do like networking to get around some of the cold calling. I think it's a great way to sort of, if you've got, if you're trying to test something, again, you're not trying to like sell a million dollars worth of product initially. It's, you know, what am I going to learn? How do I get in front of somebody that's actually going to allow me to learn? And the best way I can think of doing that is asking for advice. Very few people will turn you down if you ask for advice. Email somebody, go through LinkedIn. Um, ask friends, hey, do you know anybody who's in this kind of space or something like that? And they'll get you in touch from as, as long as you approach it in a way that's not, I'm trying to sell your best friend. Because nobody wants to do that. They don't want to set them up. That's not pleasant. It's very awkward. But if you say, hey, I'm looking for advice, they'll get you in touch with somebody. And if you pitch it that way when you're sitting in front of them, like, hey, can you help me understand? I have an idea. Can you tell me whether or not you think it makes any sense? They won't feel any pressure. They'll give you a ton of feedback. And most people like to hear themselves talk. So if you give them an opportunity to do that and you respect their opinion, they will give you a lot of feedback. Okay? Um, and depending upon how much you learn from that conversation, you may try things like what's called a trial close. Hey, well, so if we did build a product like this, you think a company like yours would buy it? Yes. Okay. Uh, you think they'd actually pay money for it? You know? Yeah. Okay. Would they pay a lot of money for it? Oh, that's something. That she'd, we'd actually pay a lot of money for that. Okay. Well, great. Okay, cool. Well, we're not there, you know. Yeah, we'll come back to you. Can I come back to you for more advice at some point? Sure, great. Now you've got an entree to come back when you actually have a prototype to sell them. Can you give me feedback on it? Oh, that's awesome. We'd totally implement that. You would? Now, now, now. Okay, great. Okay, so you've got it. So there's ways you can do that to get in front of them. Um, and, and that's an opportunity then to sort of jump in there, test the product, get out there. So summary, focus on testing and learning. That's the main thing. The number, the, if you don't walk away with anything else, learn something. Get out there and learn something with whatever it is. Talk to somebody, show them something, draw it on a napkin. It really doesn't matter as long as you're learning something. All right? And you got to be out there in the market doing that. And you know, if you're out there talking to that person that you got to through a connection or something like that, and they give you some positive feedback, you're like, hey, are you the person in the company that would actually make this kind of buying decision? They say, yes. Oh, great. Okay, well, then that feedback really matters to me. I really appreciate you giving me all that input. Oh, no? Okay, well, could, would you be willing to get me in touch with that person? Because they may have a unique perspective, and I'd love to hear theirs. Again, we're not selling anything. We're not at a point where we can sell anything, but I'd love to get their input. Can we get me in touch with them? And they'll get you to the, the person who's the buyer. Okay? So if you're out there testing, if you're learning something, you will sell something, and you will go from zero to one. And once you get one, it's a lot easier to go to ten. That's it. Good job. Good job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so now you know why I respect Sean so much. Um, I want to, Ryan Folan is going to come up here, and while he's bringing his laptop up and he's switching over, let me add to the context a little bit. And by the way, I can, everything that Sean said there, I, I can't steal any of that stuff. Actually, I can steal it, but I can't own it because it's all his and it's perfect, except for the baby comments, <laughs> right? The baby comment I own, because I remember our first one, and he's like, oh, he's like so careful, I hope he's okay, I can't leave him for a second. Now I could bounce him on his head, and people say, is he okay? I'm going, yeah, screw it, it's okay, like, they're made out of rubber. You get to your <laughs> second or third or fourth kid, you can forget where the heck you left him a couple of hours beforehand. So just, just think, what is the curse that all of startups have? Our curse is our blessing, right? It is that we treat our startup like our first baby. 
but we never move on to actually focusing on the other areas. So we are pure creatives. We want the website to be perfect. We want to make sure that the customer interaction is great. That presentation needs at least a week to make sure that the finer points in it are okay. But that's not the point that's important. The point that's important is surviving as a startup and making sure that you're okay. So I see it, um, and, and Sean talks about some great points. I see, not failure differently, kind of in the same way, but I almost see the beginning of the company differently. I see that at the beginning of every company, we are only 12.5% whole at a maximum. We do not have a complete 100% successful idea, concept, company in place. It is only 12.5%. And our every objective that we have from every minute from the moment we have that concept is a, is a quantifiable objective. So we want to get to 12.7%, 13%, 13.2%, 13.5%. And you have to have what are perceived as failures to get yourself forward. So I wake up in the morning and I say I have 50 activities. For example, this week on Friday, I had 362 activities. And they were to reach out to every single speaker at Digital Hollywood. Every one. Now, do I do that myself? No. But the person I have doing it is based over in some place far away. Maybe it cost me 15 bucks or 20 bucks to reach out through my LinkedIn to all of those people to put us in front of them with a specific message that we want. Is that a good use of my time? I don't know yet because to Sean's point, I measure it. Now, as we've measured it for years at every conference we go to, I do know it ties directly in to building up relationships with our startups and increasing the profile of Expert Dojo. So yes, tick in the box. But I want you to ask yourself as you're listening to these presentations, well, don't we lose Ryan? Oh! <laughs> okay, I want you to ask yourself, do you have a quantifiable measurement that you're working on today? that you will get to this evening with your company where you say, I achieved it or I didn't achieve it. And I will say humbly and with no judgment of the people in here that probably 80% of you do not. 80% of you will wake up this morning and you will say, I want today to be a great day. I want to make sure that I do some really special things and I push my company forward. I want to make sure that I'm perceived better in the community. And I'm just imploring you, after Sean's talk, have a quantifiable measurement on every single thing that you intend to do. Right, now, uh, are we, we're almost up. Okay, so this is great. It gives me a chance to keep on talking. So uh, I also want to just throw out two other, two other just uh, my, my fascinating learn for this week. For me, milestoning is everything. So that measurement of the activities that we expect to turn into prospects and clients by the end of the day, week, month, and year, and the actual accomplishment of those, and to Sean's point, the measurement and then the change in behavior based on what's actually happening within those specific activities, right? So for me, that's huge. And I have that, and then I combine it with brand. So I am cursed in the same way that most startups are cursed, that I'm so focused on brand that I want to make sure we have the most beautiful brand in the entire world. Now, one of our LPs, a fellow called Jeffrey, and I'm always fascinated when I see investors out in the space, like, how did you make your money? Where did you get to? How much was your focus on actually making sure that you were actually driving product or driving revenue or whatever it was? This one particular guy, a limited partner in Expert Dojo, really important guy for our company. I said to him, how did you make your money? And he says, I sell soft flooring. Now, if I showed you his website, his website maybe cost him 250 bucks, maybe. It is the most miserable, nasty, horrible website. At the top, it's got the Hollywood sign, and it says, Hollywood flooring. And underneath it, yeah, there's a picture of Hollywood flooring. And then underneath that, there's another picture of Hollywood flooring. And it doesn't even look like they're the picture. It looks like he's walked into his factory and taken a picture of a box half opened. And then a box in a different color half opened. And then another box. And then guess what comes next? Yes, it's brown flooring underneath that. But he makes $150,000 a month selling this flooring to wholesalers. And it costs him $30,000 a month to actually buy the flooring in from China. He spent no time on brand. And I'm not saying to anybody here, do not do brand. Please, don't take that as my message. My message is that if you are entirely focused on what you have to achieve today to make sure that you get the revenue in that you need to get to, you're going to build a friggin' business that tomorrow you get to a place that Sean talks about where you say, 
I validated it enough to learn enough to know that I should come in tomorrow. Because we see company after company who are doing that one thing that Sean says, which is they're around for years and years and years, and they're just surviving because there's a tiny bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and just when they feel they're going to die, like there's a small sponsorship of 1500 bucks, and then just when they think nobody loves them, then there's three users who come in. And I'm just saying be obsessive. And sometimes, by the way, that's not you, right? Sometimes you need to have another person in the team. And you need to have that person who's come in who's either going to help you or they're going to school you or they're going to come with you. Maybe, hell, even a co-founder, like somebody who comes in to help your business. Because not all of us have it. Like for me, genuinely, as a COO or a logistics person, I totally suck. So when that area becomes most important for me and for our company when we're working with people, then I have to bring in somebody who's way better than me in that space. But if we reversed it around at the beginning and it was all focused around business development, that would be different. Okay, just while, Sean's, while um, Ryan's doing that, you need a few more minutes? Um, okay, cool. Yeah, they'll, they'll get you sorted out in a second. Next is really going to be a treat because I, I, I believe massively in unfair advantage because one thing is us saying, hey, you know what? Try harder, try harder, try harder. See what you can get from it. Another thing is actually thinking, well, yeah, Brian, you can say to me, try harder, and you can say to me, cold call, and you can say to me, outreach, and you can say, well, if I reach out to the 300 people in this conference and the 300 people in that conference, and I cold call the 14 sponsors, and I do this, well, nobody's friggin' answering me, and I can't get through to them, and they won't come back to me, and it's actually really hard to do this. Like, what are the other options that I can do to try and build my business? Now, if we get time later on, I will touch on partnerships and I will touch on affiliates and I will touch on like how you can increase that unfair advantage yourself. But I really want to focus next on Ryan, which is influence level. How do you get your influence level to a place where you can bypass a lot of that really tough stuff at the start? Now, I don't think Rebecca's here, but I can tell you her business with her plan on how to go forward using an influencer, my guess is that she will have about three to four million users on her platform next year with zero marketing, zero outreach, zero cold calling, but one very, very strong value proposition that she was able to put to a very high level influencer who was massively impactful in that space. And you may say, okay, that's cool, Brian, but I don't know any influencers, I don't know any people, and, and I haven't seen Ryan's presentation yet on how to increase my own influence, so I don't know how to do that. But how do we get to it? And I can tell you our story on Expert Dojo, and that's that part of the problem today is that we're in this world of immediacy, right? We, we, we call somebody, they don't answer, and we go, the world sucks. Like, what the hell? They, didn't, they rejected me, screw them. I'm, I'm better than that, I'm a, I'm a strong person, I'm not gonna call him back again. And what we forget is, it doesn't work like that. It works as part of breadcrumbs. And breadcrumbs are like this crazy, weird, random thing that can't be learned. But if you put the breadcrumbs in the right place for the right period of time, it is weird as hell how a month, or a week, or a month, or a year later, those breadcrumbs come to you. And I remember with Ryan, when I first came here like four years ago, and I knew absolutely nobody in LA, and we said, let's create this, these phenomenal workshops which are done with Mark Cuban and Kevin Harrington and all these huge people, and we're going to get them to come to places like UCLA and USC and Loyola and the colleges, and they're going to teach the kids how to become great entrepreneurs of the future, and of course they're going to want to do it because it's a beautiful cause. Now, of course, I have this Machiavellian um, hidden agenda where I want to become friends with them all so they can all become our influencers and we can use them in the future. But in the, on the face of it, I'm a beautiful human being and I want to like save the world through the colleges. And of all of the outreach we did, and I promise you, I hit them on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. How many responses? Like nothing. Not a thing. Like nobody gave a shit. They didn't care, right? But three years later, we had, like last week, Kevin Harrington calling up saying, hey, we've heard about, and if you don't know him, he's like, as seen on TV, ex-Shark Tank guy. And he's like, hey, we've heard about Expert Dojo, and I think it could be really good. I like, we're going to be coming down into this area. We'll come through soon. Like, how does this happen? It's not random. 
And it's not because we did one activity and then got upset and then walked away and came back and said, oh man, that didn't work. We're gonna try something new the next time around. It was because I continued it on. We continued on with really strong content marketing to these people because these people were super important to the company being successful. So I want you to look at the influence level as like a massively, massively important part. Okay, listen, I'm gonna shut up for a second. I wanna just give you, were there any questions? Because we didn't really, um, really put it out for questions with when Sean finished uh, because he knew he was gonna be an engineer very shortly afterwards. Uh, did you have any questions for Sean after the last, after the last um, talk? Just on, on either how to do the sales or how to outreach with the sales? Anybody, what did you have? Yeah. And I'll take you next, Betsy. Sure. Could you comment on the, the issue of testing an idea and then getting feedback from the idea? Okay, so can I comment on that? I'll, I'll throw it in and you tell me if you disagree, Sean. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Like I haven't, I've heard maybe 3,000 ideas since I've started Expert Dojo, and there's not one single idea that I've heard. Outside the medical space, I'm leaving medical aside, right? But outside medical devices are, are things that, you know, are here to cure cancer. There's not one single idea that I have ever heard which I would not be afraid to share. You know what we do at Expert Dojo? Like with every single company coming through, and we get them all the time. Like we do, so we have the accelerator, but we also have training academies, and then we also have you know, places that people can grow their business, like growth academies. I go to anybody that I think that wants to start an expert dojo type company, and I show them our training videos. I show them to them. I open it up to them. Why do I do that? I don't want to be, I don't want to be useless. I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to have a product which is just okay. I want to have the most incredible brand in the world that makes a difference. And the only way that I can do that is by bringing other people into the space. Because if my mission is really to improve the life of entrepreneurs through higher success, then we have to have more people continuing to raise the boats, right? So I'm just saying, if you ever came to me and you said, Brian, I want you to sign an NDA, I would say, God bless you, good luck, enjoy your life. And it's not a disrespect, it's not an anything, I just know how useless they are. And I know that 99.9999999999999999% of all ideas are not successful, not because somebody stole them, right? This is not a Facebook world. They're not successful because they are not implemented, not executed properly. The curse that we have is we spend all of our time, and especially at this conference, it's this conference more than any other conference I go to, there are so many people in stealth. There are so many people, I'm like, I'm like a week in stealth, a month in stealth, four months in stealth, and I know for a fact, in a year's time when I come back, because I love this place, like I've been building it up over five years, I know for a fact they'll still be here in stealth. And there will still be an awesome reason for them to be in stealth, and it is a curse. And I'm with Sean, get this, get this bad boy out to market as soon as you can, unless, like I said, there are some really good reasons, by the way. And there are, there are some products, like, man, have you got a fidget spinner? And, but even a fidget spinner, like, get it to market. I mean, who knew, right? <laughs> Hundreds of millions of fidget spinners. Did I miss anything? Or? Let me try one, one thing. On, on the subject of does the idea matter, or can it be stolen, all kind of stuff, or is the idea more important than anything else, I would say idea is like nothing, execution is everything. And to give you a perfect example, this comes from my own history. My first startup, how many people have heard of Airbnb, obviously, right? And they were founded in 2008, right? In the year 2000, I founded a company to do what Airbnb did. And I actually got into Columbia University's incubator, uh, started the company, tried to get it going. Um, I'm not on any speaking panels for that. Um, that. That obviously didn't work. So nobody's heard of that company. Um, that company flopped. Uh, so it, it isn't the idea. And, and obviously I wasn't secretive about it, um, but it had nothing to do with somebody stealing the idea. It was purely the execution sucked. I failed the execution. So that's why I'm not a billionaire today. <laughs> Yeah, follow on, yeah? Yeah, you know, um, I understand all that, and I agree with it. Uh, but what's also true is that Uber has a knockoff in China, and Group Buy has knockoffs all over South America. So all of these things do get replicated. And execution, while it's vital in a start startup, it's also easy to replicate execution. Absolutely. Why did Uber get knocked off and Airbnb didn't get knocked off in China? Actually, let's talk about Uber, possibly the worst execution of an idea ever. Let's talk about Amazon, possibly the worst execution of an idea ever. That's why they lost $6 billion in their first uh, 10 years. Let's talk about Tesla, worst execution of an idea ever. 
right? Which is why they don't even have a model to go forward. Uber don't even have a model to go forward in the future. They didn't even build a proper brand for China. They went in like a bunch of arrogant jerks with no idea what they were doing, walked into a market in a different culture with different people, expecting to get the same results because they had a bunch of money and they thought that money would buy the market. They did a shit job. So they deserve to have the crap kicked out of them in China. And they didn't actually, by the way, get their idea stolen from them. They got the shit kicked out of them by two competitors who got together and beat them up like they were Conor McGregor in the middle of a ring. <laughs> That's what happened to Uber in China, okay? And I liked that boy before, but he had a bad, he had a bad night the other week. So, no, I'm just I'm, I'm saying, I'm not knocking it. You're right, but if you can execute properly in one country, you make so many billions of dollars, who cares? And then if you execute it really well, they're going to want you in the other country. Airbnb are a model of one of the greatest ex executions that has ever been done in America, and, and even better execution over in China because they did it entirely aligned with Chinese culture, partners, and people there, and they're going to be one of the biggest companies in the world. And by the way, surprise, surprise, they make money. Okay, well, the others don't. Ryan, over to you, buddy. Give it up for Brian, the man who's not afraid of the microphone. All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to jump right into this. I'm excited. I came all the way from Los Angeles to be here, okay? Now, we're going to talk about personal branding, and the fact of the matter is, if no one knows who you are, your business is useless. And I'm going to explain why, and I'm going to explain how, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty. If I can advance my slide. If you want to follow along for the rest of my life, because personal branding is a lifelong journey, this is where to find me. If you find anything in particularly of interest today and you want to snap a photo of it, feel free to do so. Hit me up on Twitter, because otherwise you're being selfish. Whatever information we have here and whatever information I share, the more it can go out into the world, the better off we all are, because I believe, like Brian does, in abundance. Just because your personal brand is strong doesn't mean somebody else's can be strong. And just because your business is strong because of your brand doesn't mean there's other people in the marketplace. So let's not be selfish and let's share. I think it's important you know why you're on social media. I live on Twitter. I'm pretty much still getting warmed up to Facebook. Instagram, I draw stick figure drawings. LinkedIn's a good place to connect. And if you want to know more about my ultimate passion, it's this 313 method, which we're just going to touch on today. And you can do some more research online. So let's get going. The words that you choose and choose not to use are your competitive advantage. Let me repeat that. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, all this technology coming down the line, it does not impact the words you choose to use. And the words you choose not to use is what helps people get interested in the words that you choose. So today we're gonna to talk about word choice and how that positions you as an expert in your field, because nobody wants to buy your product or services, they're buying into you. I've talked with a lot of CEOs, a lot of companies, and the number one concern, growth. They want to grow. Sure, all this other stuff is important, but how do we grow? And I'm gonna show you how you grow your business by growing your influence. Your influence in an intentional branding. Intentional branding is that you're not just posting for the sake of posting, but that you are posting to continue a narrative that you are controlling. The more you talk, the less people listen. And that is probably one of your biggest problems. The problem is that entrepreneurs talk too much. You talk so much that you talk yourself out of deals. You talk yourself out of doing things. You talk yourself out of relationships. You ultimately talk yourself out of business. You also talk so much you don't give somebody else a chance to speak including your customers, including your partners. I'm here to solve that problem for you. That problem, by the end of this conversation, will hopefully be done, because all you need to know is to keep it simple and make it powerful. The more complex you come across, the more you boggle down the neurons in someone's brain, and they do not want to listen. I'll let you snap that one. That's a good one. Yeah, don't be selfish. That's good. As a business leader, this is where you are. You're looking at the signs. Which way do I go? Where do I invest my time? Where do I invest my money? Where do I invest my marketing dollars? What the heck do I do? Well, it's simple. Because if you don't know the answer to that question, then you're kind of screwed. My question to you is, what do you do when someone asks you, what do you do? Now this gap in between the time that I stop talking and you start talking, is one of your superpowers. 
how fast do you think the average time is from my stopping to talk in a conversation and you starting? How fast do you think that happens? Take a guess. Two seconds. Okay, it's, it's under a second. Let me give you a reference. The amount of time it takes Hussein Bolt to run 10 meters top speed is 0.8 seconds. The amount of time it takes for a honeybee to flap its wings 100 times is 0.5 seconds. The amount of time it takes for us to blink an eye, watch, is 0.3 seconds. This gap, according to recent linguistics research, is smaller than all of those. Faster than Hussein Bolt, faster than a honeybee, and faster than the blink of an eye. It's 0.2 seconds. 0.2 seconds. That is fascinatingly fast. And you know what's even crazier? You know how long it takes to retrieve one word from memory and then actually say it? Take a guess. It's more than 0.2 seconds. It's 0.6 seconds. So do you see what happens here? Is that in our conversations, when you are talking with someone, you are not necessarily listening to the end of their conversation. You are picking up on cues and you're waiting for them to finish what they're saying so that you can pounce on there. Okay? The one thing that you have control over in this life, and we're talking from politics to religion to what your significant other thinks, is the time you choose to take before you choose to speak. That is the only, that is the one thing you have control over. So as we talk about what we're going to talk about today, how do you implement this? You shut up, you stop talking, and you don't worry about reveling in that pause. From 0.2 seconds, increase it a little bit, think about what you're going to say, that means you're listening to the person. You guys got it? Say yes. All right. I said yes, not yet. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Are we awake? All right. Let's get going. I'm going to level with you real quick. Not that I haven't been leveling already. I don't care what you do. You, sir, I don't care what you do. Ma'am, even though you're whispering, I still don't care what you're whispering about. I don't care what you do. I do not care what you do. And nobody does. I only care about the problem that you solve. I only care about the problem that you solve, and I'm interested in that problem if I have it, or my friend has it, or my family member has it. So what happens is that somebody asks you what you do, and you tell them what you do. Burr, wrong answer, because they don't care. You know what happens. They're just asking you what you do so that you can explain while they don't listen, and then meow, jump on the conversation to tell them to tell you what they do. But you don't really care, because you're trying to figure out if they were listening to what you said. And this happens all day, every day. So what is the problem that you solve? And can you say that in one sentence? It's a lot more difficult than you might think. And you might think, eh, I got that. But I can tear you apart because it's not going to be the problem that you solve. It's going to be what you do. So here we go. We're going to show you how all this ties in together. This is a top level. This is how you get people interested in your ideas without telling them what you do. If you solve a problem and you can communicate that problem, here's how the conversation goes. Hi, Ryan, what do you do? Well, it's funny, it's not what I do that's important. It's the problem that I solve. That's kind of weird. What problem do you solve? The problem is that entrepreneurs talk too much. So much that they talk themselves out of opportunity, out of a job, out of business, out of relationships, out of top performers. It's terrible. Now, do you think that that's a problem? Yes. Do you know anybody with that problem? Yes. Do you have that problem? Yes. Are you looking to fix that problem anytime soon? Yes. Cool. I can help you out. You don't even know what I do, but you're interested because it's all based on the problem that you solve. Let's take it another route. Is this a problem? No. Hold on a minute, why is it not a problem? Let's talk about it. Let's try it again. Is this a problem? Yes. Do you have this problem? No. Awesome. Do you know anybody who has that problem? Great, I can help them out. You see what's happening here? You can get people interested in what you do, which is influence at the end of the day. By not telling them what you do, but instead telling them the problem that you solve. And that, my friends, is your personal brand. Your personal brand is the problem that you solve. Your company brand is the combination of the personal brands of your employees and your executives to make that corporate brand. Because people want to do business with people. I have a 313 methodology that we could spend an entire hour going through, but today I'm not going to do that. 
You can find the information online, you can get it somewhere else, or you can talk with me and we can work through it. But essentially, the 313 method helps you explain your brand in three sentences, one sentence, and three words. The problem you solve, your solution, and the market, all with slight tweaks, which mathematically can be combined into one sentence six different ways, and ultimately, you can describe who you are in terms of things that have nothing to do with you. That's just a teaser. But today, I'm going to talk about the step after the 313. I'm going to assume that you know the problem that you solve, you know your solution, and you know your market. But now what? Comes with what I call the four Vs. Vision, voice, volume, validation. Everyone say it with me. Vision, Vision. Voice. voice, volume, volume. Validation. validation. I mispronounced that. Now, let's try it with our hands, right? There's a V for each one. This is what gets you going, because if your blood's not flowing, you're not going to get the rest of the presentation, so this is for your own good. Ready? We're going to say first, vision. vision. Voice. Voice. Volume. 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 Validation. Validation. Don't worry, we're going to do that at the end. It'll feel a lot better. But hopefully you feel the blood flowing, okay? A blood, blood, brain without blood is not good. So here we go. We're going to work through these. What is your personal brand? It's your purpose, it's who you are. How many people here have a personal brand? Raise your hand. If you have a brand, raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. If you didn't raise your hand, look at me in the eyes. You have a brand too. In fact, everyone has a brand. You know what your brand is? It's what people describe you as. It's who you are. It's a combination of all the stories that have comprised of your life. But if you don't feel or believe that you have a brand, it just means that you're not taking control of the narrative. Think about that. Your brand is there, and it's time to take control of that narrative so you can take advantage of it. Who you are, what is your purpose, what is your mission, this all boils down to the problem that you're solving. So let's talk about this. How many people have Googled themselves in the last week? Raise your hand. Last month? Last year? What you find online is what Mr. Google or Mrs. Google or it Google thinks about you. And if you're not checking to see what other people are saying about you online, then you're not taking control of the narrative. I'm gonna share with you a fun exercise. Are you guys open to trying this exercise when you leave? Yeah. See, you don't even know what I'm doing, but I got you to commit, that's awesome. Your personal brand is not what you think you are. Your personal brand is not what others think that you are. Your personal brand is the intersection between what you wanna be known for and what people think about you. It is in that intersection. So all you need for this is two sets of post notes and a lot of friends. Here are the steps. First, you get two sets of post notes. I prefer the traditional yellow and then blue, but that's just me. So sit with whichever one you like the most, for me, the traditional yellow, and you write down all of the words, the traits, the things that you want people to think about when they describe you. They can be adjectives, they can be verbs, they can be phrases. This is truly what your ideal brand is gonna look like. Then you put them all in a shoebox. Then you go out to your friends, your family, your coworkers, Brian McMahon, Dustin, and you say, hey, if you were gonna describe me and I wasn't there, what words would you use and can you put these on these post-it notes? It is totally anonymous, so I'm not gonna, no hard feelings, but be honest. I want you to write this down. You do this with five, 10, 20 people, you get a whole bunch of these post-it notes back. Now, the value is when you take the blue post-it notes and you take the yellow post-it notes and you stick them all up onto the wall. What you then do is you start to group and cluster them into groups. You're gonna have some circles that are only yellow, what I think I wanna be known for. Circles that are only blue, what people recognize me for, but I don't wanna be recognized for. And then the magic combo, those circles and groups and clusters of post-it notes with both blue and yellow. Those are the magic sauce. That is the traits and qualities where I already want to be known for that and people know me as that. What you do then is magical because you choose three of those groupings. Three, because that's how we count. Ready? One, two, three, many. Spanish, uno, dos, tres, mucho. French, un, dos, trois, buco. Okay? Hana, dual, set, a lot. Okay? So the idea here is that you choose three different compiling of these groupings and you, and you categorize them. Two of them can be professional, one of them has to make you human. I repeat, two of them can be professional, one of them has to make you human. 
You see, what this exercise does is it helps to determine what your brand is in reality. It's a combination of what people think about you and what you want to be known for. Because I'll tell you what, it is a lot easier to convince somebody of something that they already know as opposed to convincing them of something that they don't already know. People know you for a lot of stuff. This exercise helps to narrow it down to three. One, two, three. So once you have these three traits, right, for me, innovation, communication, and sailing. Now those can change throughout, but it's important to have three. Have you ever asked somebody what they're all about or what they do, and then they go, yeah, well, I like to sail on communication, I like, really, I'm not going to sail on You stopped listening after about three items. So what is that core three that represent you, and be proud of it, one of them has to make you human. Now, what do you do with this, and how do you have it help you reach your goals? Enter the personal branding starship. That's right. It's like a drone starship that's anti-gravity, and it has these three propellers on it. Those three propellers are the three fundamental pillars, your triangle of influence, the things that you want to be known for and what makes you human. Just like a drone, it can lead forward with sailing, it can lead to the side with communication, it can spin around and lead with innovation. Because as you're talking with people, the less you say, the more people ask questions. And when people ask questions, it leads to a conversation. And conversation creates curiosity. And curiosity is what actually creates the connection and will help you close deals. Okay? So the branding starship, let's take you on this journey. First, you have to have the engines. The engines are the three things that people know you as that you want to be known for. One has to make you human. Next step, find your destination. Where are you going? I know where I'm going. Who wants to tell me where they're going? What is your vision? Where is your goal with your business or your life? Come on now. Who has their vision? Where are you going? The beach? Yeah, that's where I'm going. Actually, my goal, my destination is I will either be speaking or sailing and hopefully doing the same around the world. That's where I'm going. My life, everything that I'm doing is geared towards either speaking or sailing in that combination. Now, this is eventual, and I get to play in it as I go along. But honestly, who knows where their vision is? What is your, de what is your desert island or deserted island? Come on. I'd say everyone shout it out together, but I know that's going to fall flat. Yes, ma'am. Beautiful home in Santa Monica Canyon, OK? Wonderful. Wonderful, fabulous video content out of her own home. I like that. Who else? Where's your vision? 10 years. Guy Morgenstein, where are you going to be in 10 years? Oh, wait, wait. Are you guys OK if we, um, if we have a separate conference that only takes 30 seconds? Yes or no? Yes or no? Welcome to the professional speaking up your game communication seminar that will only last for about 20 seconds. If you learn nothing else from today, from this specific mini conference, don't ever start a sentence with the word um. No matter what you do, you can use um throughout your conversation, I don't care. But no matter what you do, if you leave this room today, don't ever start a sentence with um. You know why? Because that's the pause. That's the gap that you have the most control over. That is the one thing that is your power in a conversation. So from now on, just today, if I ask you to answer questions starting, you say, um, I'm going to go, Burr, and we'll get you through it. Because the only way to get over the ums, starting with an um, is calling you on it. So, Guy, I'm sorry, but thank you for that mini conference. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Don't start your sentence with um. Coaching top CEOs. Coaching top CEOs. Where? Santa Monica. Santa Monica? Okay, what type of business? What type of industry? Uh, Burr. Here's where I'm going at. If you don't know where you want to go, how the heck are you going to get there? If you don't know that you want to end up in your home creating awesome videos and great content, you're not going to get there. I ask this question so many times. I'm like, where do you want to go? Well, what do you mean? Where do you want to be? I don't know. If you cannot answer this question, stop. Do not pass go. You will not collect $200. You will just go off into space at whatever speed you have in the wrong direction. And I can't iterate this enough. Prove to me that I'm wrong. How many, how many people actually know where they want to go? Okay, blue in the back, that was strong. Where are you going? I, uh, 
Cool. What kind of stages? Awesome. We can get you there. Okay. One more person. Come on. Help me out. Yes, sir. Okay. And I can get you there. Clap for this man. Clap for that lady. Clap for that man. Clap for everybody. I'm telling you, you are all looking for hacks. You're all looking for secrets. You're all looking for ways to cut corners. There is no corner cutting when it comes to figuring out where you want to go. If you do not know where you want to go, you will not get there. It's that simple. So stop looking for hacks. Figure out where you're going to go. That's step number one. Step number two is do what I call an asteroid audit. Now, I love post notes. I'm actually trying to get sponsors for them. So post a note. Here's another example of me shouting you out, okay? Use post-it notes to identify asteroids in your life. An asteroid, as I define it, is something that takes up your time. Now, an asteroid is not necessarily good or bad, but you can determine whether or not this asteroid is preventing you from where you want to go, or if it's a good landing spot that will help you on your way. Let me say that again. Every single one of these asteroids is what you spend time on. Do you spend time going to the gym? Yes or no? Raise your hand. Okay. That's a good asteroid, right? Going to the gym will help you with everything else. How many people will play video games? Okay. All right. That's okay. Now, video games could get you where you want to go if that's where you want to go. The point here is that if you are somebody who complains, I just don't have enough time, Ryan. I just don't have enough time. No. You're investing time in the wrong spot. So an, astro an asteroid audit will help you determine that. So what do you do? You basically find out what all these different elements are, and on one side you list all of the things that you are actually going to, that you've done, and the things that you have gotten done. So the idea here is that with each one of these time breakdowns, first of all, decide where you're at with that. Are you finishing a degree? Great. How much further do you need to go? Be cognizant of that. And then eliminate the asteroids in your life that are sucking your time, that are not helping you get towards your goal. This is crazy powerful. Then, get going. And it's as simple as that. There's your easy hack. Find out where you want to go. Find out where you're spending your time. Eliminate the amount of time on the things that are not getting you to where you want to go, and then go. Now, I have a short amount of time, so we're going to get going. Voice. Voice is how you communicate the problem that you solve, your personal brand, and it comes in the form of content. Content is how you share your voice along your journey. How many people here are public speakers? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hands down. Everyone who did not raise your hand, look into my eyes. If you speak in public, then you are a public speaker. It's a scientific fact that you cannot argue either. Talking to your mom or talking to your dad or even with your friends or maybe Dustin's cat. If you speak in public, you are a public speaker. And the one thing that's going to hold you back in business and life is something called your own brain. Because thoughts become words and words become things, and you have to think the thoughts that you want. And if you're not a public speaker, you're going to look for signs to show that you're not a public speaker. So business and life starts with thinking that becomes words that becomes actions. You've always got to be ready to pitch, and that's through the problem that you solve. Now, when it comes to writing, Writing is another form of talent discovery. Writing takes time, but writing is exciting. Now, when it comes to content creation tips, how many people like to talk more than they like to write? Okay. Talk into Google Docs. Talk into a microphone. Record it, transcribe it. Great tip. Next, images. Using image-based, if you're afraid of writing, that's totally cool. Um, I use stick figures on my Instagram account, and that's where I got a lot of traction early. Now, think about taking photos as the lens of the provider. We're going to skip through this. Posting smarter, not harder. So you've got your vision. Then you've got your voice. It comes through writing. It comes through images. It comes through speaking. Volume is taking your content and distributing it far and wide. I believe you can have the same content distributed on all channels because there's different people on different channels. Validation. How many people here own their own website with their name? If you do not have your hand up, look into my eyes. Your website is the only thing you own online. Well, what? I have a business, Ryan. I have a business website. Yeah, 
But what if your business goes out of business? Then you lose everything. You have to have a personal brand to put in front of your company. And if you don't have a personal brand, you don't have a website, okay? That's how to control it. We're gonna skip that. This is a good concept, the difference between liking and sharing. Here's your answers. When you like things, it's a distance. When you share it, there's an emotional tie. You're making people feel smarter. Be conscious of the types of communication that you're using. We talk about influence, and I'm gonna wrap this up here, Mr. Brian. Find a platform and stick to it. I like Twitter. I love Twitter. I use Twitter at conferences. I out-tweet everyone at conferences. It helps me to get deals. It helps me to bring inbound. This is in China with 16,000 people. I out-tweeted everyone. Now, the funny story is that I'm not just tweeting to tweet. I'm tweeting my notes. People take notes. I take public notes. Share your information, and people will start to levitate towards you as an expert. Not going to do that. Engagement drives engagement. Plan to focus. Focus on your plan. You will get published. You will get noticed. And here's the opportunity test that I want to leave you with. To do or not to do? That is the question. And here is how you solve that. When you get an opportunity, ask yourself two questions. Is this on brand? Does this make me money? If the answer is yes to both, do it. If the answer is yes to one and no to the other, think about it. If the answer is no to both, don't do it. Because the one thing that you have is time, and that time is precious. So choose what you are investing your time with, and instead of being scattered all over the place, you'll be in one line going where you want to go. My final thoughts are, it's great. The greatest time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. You know what the second best time is? Today. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Just to humor me, I want a vision, voice, volume validation together, nice and loud. And then when you're done, you can put your hands together. The way to create a personal brand so that your business is successful because people like doing business with people is vision, voice, volume, validation. Ready? One, two, three. Vision, vision. Voice. voice, volume, volume. validation. Yeah. Now you can clap. <laughs> All right. Just incredible. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to check me out, check me out over here. I will be around for a bit. I've got cards and I've got two books that I will give to Brian, who's in this book, and I will give to you, sir. Uh, whoever you think deserves it, you can give it to him, because I ran out of time. Thank you, bye. Okay, can I, 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 I want to give this book to whoever can come up with the most interesting word to describe Brian. Ooh. Ginger Cannon. Ginger Cannon doesn't count, That's That doesn't count, that one's, that one's used already. <laughs> Passionate, all right. Do we have better, do we have, and it doesn't have to be nicer, by the yeah, way. Yeah, you this can, isn't, this is not a, This is oh, a post-it note that you write, right? This, this, by the way, this is not <laughs> a safe place, okay? So it can be, it's just the best word to describe Ryan. Positively like, energetic, that's three words, you're disqualified. Likeable, what, what it, Frantic, I kind of like that. Hopefully there's structure in the franticness. Yes, ma'am. Entertaining, I like that, yes. I don't know what it is, that means I like it. He gets a book. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. It, what's good or bad? All right, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me this other book because I want to give it to the guy who said a word that I don't know. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Whether it's frantic or eloquent or exciting or whatever, all I want you to know is not to say "um" as a first word and own your personal brand and you are a public speaker. Goodbye. Okay, great job, Ryan. As always, uh, incredibly insightful and really helpful for everyone. And I'll take, and, and Ryan has this wonderful talent of being able to just make stuff fun. So a half an hour goes through really quickly, but his work is incredibly important. We don't realize, sometimes we get so torn into our business that we don't realize how important our personal brand is. I am 100% sure that 80, 90% of what happened, what has happened at Expert Dojo is because of me and what I implemented at the start because it was only me. And, and since then, things have happened that have made it really important. And then other people came in, and it became about those other people and what they brought into the company and everything else. It's the same with you. As you were the CEO of your own company at the start, the people who are buying from you, partnering with you, being affiliates with you, those people are doing it because of what you mean to them. Or how Ryan puts in a lot of his talks, 
how you make them feel. And the more we destigmatize the fact that we feel small and weak and we don't have enough money to get us through the day and we're struggling and they're big and strong and they've got huge big jobs within corporations, and the more we move it to, they're just the same damn human beings as we are. They got the same problems at home. They got different money problems, but the same money problems. They got different relationship problems, but the, it's the same. So build your brand up to a place that you're not begging from people that they see you as a person and a company that they should be working alongside. And then make sure that as you're then working with them, you make them feel, okay? Thank you very much, Ryan. That was brilliant. Um, now I want to bring up Paige Ostro. Uh, Paige is a great friend of mine. Any of you in the entertainment space or who have been around digital Hollywood for a while, you will know her as one of the biggest film financiers in the business for 15, 20 years. If there was a script that was gonna come on the market, it would make its way over to Paige. She had a team, please come on up Paige. I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce you as you walk just so we can get the full effect. Yeah, see, <laughs> um, and, and, and anything that happened within the space, she knew it. Now, th there's a couple of things that I massively admire about Paige. Number one, she, like today we look at Paige, and Paige is retired and has a massively successful career, you know, funding, I mean, she'll say, but on the credits of hundreds of movies and scripts that have come through. But there was a time, right at the beginning, when she was at zero, and she was just starting, and she was thinking, and, and, and it'll, be inter it'll be one of the first questions I'm gonna ask her, but it's like, at that moment, she was exactly the same as you, and what we all wanna do is go on that journey that takes us to the place that we build up this massively important business that makes a lot of money and puts us into a place that we can make our own life choices. So I wanna, we're gonna look both on that area, but also on the space, and especially for those of you who are entertainment here today, because it is digital Hollywood, I wanna try and make sure that we give you some insight as to how you can take that step that may seem impossible within the space. So, a big round of applause, please, for Paige Ostro. And we're gonna do this, look, I'm, I'm trying to mix this up this morning, because hell, it's a morning, we don't do breaks or any of that kind of stuff, so we're just gonna power through. So I'm just gonna make the format a tiny bit different. So for this, we're gonna chat like the friends that we are. And I'm gonna throw a couple of questions at Paige, and she may answer them, or she may not, or she may say some other stuff, and then I will bring some questions out. And then after this, we're gonna do a, a really important piece on just bot technology, chatbots. I want you to understand chatbots if you don't understand them. We'll go through it for about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe some other efficiencies in there as well, and then you can come back and ask any questions at the end that you want. We'll have like 15, 20 minutes or do that. But firstly, Paige, tell us, actually, it only occurred to me while I was introducing you about that whole, that you went through this whole process. How did you go from zero to one? Like nobody knew you, it was right at the beginning, you had this concept of being this force that was gonna help people who could not get their scripts out there to becoming one of the biggest people in the space. Like, what did you do at the start? Just Whew. in everything. Well, I showed up, first of all. So I was thinking on the way here that 50% of the battle is just showing up. You know, how many people didn't feel like or second guess themselves about coming today, right? And the great thing about showing up is you just really never know what what's going to transpire. But not a lot happens if you don't leave the house, right? So, uh, and then I was also thinking over here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna divert a little bit from the question and then come back to it if that's okay. Totally. Uh, I was thinking on the way over here that from the time I started in this industry, uh, and I'll be dating myself slightly because email wasn't even popular yet internet wasn't happening. And now I'm speaking here at Digital Hollywood. And I was concerned about being relevant. So last night, I viewed some YouTube videos of the people speaking about the film industry in today's uh, uh, landscape. And what I found was nobody said anything new that I didn't already know or haven't said at speaking engagements in Cannes or, or Sundance or Toronto Film Festival or Wherever I've spoken in the world, anything that I've said, I actually didn't hear all that much new. Fortunately, my neighbor, because I was panicking as I was walking the dog, thinking, it's a different time, it's been a couple years since I had my company, how am I going to be of service and offer some valuable information at this event? And so my neighbor writes for Entertainment and Forbes. Perfect, she just published an article yesterday, <laughs> she was telling me as I was walking the dog, about uh, Hollywood, digital media, Hollywood, and where we're at with 
what I reg regrettably poo pooed a few years ago when people would say, well, what about selling my movie to Netflix or Hulu? And I would say, well, who, who made, who's made money there? When are they ever going to make any money? <laughs> so now, a few years later, this Forbes article was published yesterday highlighting the equal amount of nominations for Emmy Awards between Netflix and HBO, right? And I'm sorry, I digress. Uh, Netflix had more nominations than HBO did for Emmys. They tied in the wins. And so we're definitely uh, living in a different time. The other thing I thought of on the way over here is that uh, because I saw the industry go through so many changes in my lengthy career, uh, there, there was a time when films went from being shot, thank you, being shot on film to being shot digitally, right? And as I was looking down and driving and making sure everything was on right, I realized that my outfit, minus the jewelry, okay, <laughs> was in, w cost enough to finance a digital film these days. You could make a movie for the price of my, my clothes, right? And now if you added the jewelry, I was trying to think how many movies could, could you make today. And there was a time where that was absolutely 100% not in, in, in my uh, consciousness or in anybody's uh, thought pattern. It used to cost millions of dollars to make a movie and they were on reels, on film. And uh, so I was thinking on the way over here that nobody has an excuse. There's no excuse for A, not being able to make a movie or making a movie, or B, uh, not being able to make money on your movie because <laughs> with, with how little it costs, technically, you should be able to turn a profit of some kind if you have any little bit of talent and a skill with respect to marketing. But uh, you asked me a question, and so I, I just wanted to get that out there before I forgot it, but about, uh, well, I think, up, how I started. Yeah, you bring up, I didn't stick on that in a second, okay. I want to get back to you yeah. because you bring up a, a really, a really relevant point. On one side of it, it's never been easier. Whether you're in the movies or entertainment, or whether some of you may be in some other spaces as well, it has never been easy for, uh, for us to bring our passion out to the market. But there's also never been more people out there who are able to do it, right? So Everybody can make a movie now. There's every, how many people in here have made a movie? Lots of people. So when I've spoken in the past years ago, there may have been, depending where, what the venue was, and uh, you know, obviously if you were in, in Cannes Film Festival, you'd have a lot of people who had completed a film. But uh, there's just a lot, lot more room for, for profitability, I would say, these days, because the budgets are so minimal. And is the road different from market for as far as marketing your movie these so days? So that's what was interesting about the talks. So I think I've now, almost highlighted the only changes. So everything else in all the talks that I was listening to of all colleagues the talks about, do you have a good story? Are you willing to live, breathe, and eat that subject matter, that story? Is it something that you are close to, familiar with, and want to tell? Uh, because it's something, I, I spoke on a panel with, uh, with uh, Michael Moore, Michael, Kathleen Glynn, who produ really did all the heavy lifting, she was married to Michael Moore, did all those fabulous documentaries. And she and he were both saying at that festival how for years you have to live, eat, breathe, and sleep that subject matter. So before you set forth to make a movie that you think is a great idea, you really want to think about, hey, do I really want to spend the next several years talking about this subject matter, repeating it over and over again, right? But it better be something you know very closely. And uh, uh, this kind of ties into, I can, I can get back to the initial question, which is basically, um, uh, I'll try to make it short, but uh, it started with getting fired off a movie in Toronto. I was working as an assistant director. This is one of those great I got fired stories. 
and they let me go three days early. I'd had it out with the craft service girl because uh, she brought food into a restaurant where we were taking cover from rain and the restaurant tours were getting mad. So I told the craft service girl, you know, you really shouldn't bring food in here, but I didn't know she was related to the executive producer. So she had a beef with me and I got uh, fired three days uh, left on the film. So the union at the time said, well, don't worry, you'll be paid. Do with your time what you will. So I went to Toronto Film Festival. There I met the right hand to Alliance, which is Canada's largest production distribution film company. And he offered me a terrific opportunity. He said, you can pay your own flight. You can get your own place to live, pay for that. And you can work on commission. And you can come to Hollywood and... Uh, You'll be meeting with writers, directors, and producers, and we'll be looking for projects for Alliance, for this company here in Canada. And I said, sign me up, I'm on my way. <laughs> and out I came from Canada. And uh, he soon came up with some other ideas about how his life should go, but not before introducing me to the American film market. And the American film market, how many of you are familiar with the American film market? Okay, it's about to take place again and it's an international convention based in Santa Monica where all the film buyers come and, and, uh, and filmmakers and writers, producers, directors attend and everybody schmoozes and films get sold to different countries. And because I had a command of several languages and I already understood the product being film because I had worked as an assistant director on probably seven pictures when Toronto became like Hollywood North and because of the exchange rate and the good crews, and it could double as any American city, it was a very popular place to shoot. But now I got an introduction to the American film market, the business end of things, and because I spoke the languages and could speak about film in an educated manner, I was able to get contracts. And it's another long story, which I won't take the time to tell you now, but it sort of all happened by accident or, or not, depending by on osmosis, how you look at right? it. The bre it's, it's, as I mentioned earlier on, like the breadcrumbs always lead to a place. And when you right. look back, it makes sense. I actually, I love what you said at the start with about the turning up. I had about three texts from people this morning who desperately need to learn how to go from zero to one. You know, one had a headache, another one had a cold, um, another one just wasn't feeling that well, felt that the trip may not be a good idea. I mean, I can tell you last night, in between taking care of my kid, I found it important enough to go over to a LAVA event, Los Angeles Venture Association, with like 20, 30 people. We had an event over at Expert Dojo. I also had another event outside, and I passed by a final event to get here. Because for me, it's important for me to turn up for my entrepreneurs who are out there. So that whole turning up is massive on this type of level. And then you look back and you say something like you just said there, I don't know, maybe it was lucky, maybe it wasn't. It's well, never actually, lucky. I'll tell you the story. Right. I'll tell you what happened. So I met a film distributor and he said, you remind me of Penny Marshall. And I went, oh, thank you. And so he said, you know, you should, come, you should at AFM, you should represent me and sell my movies to the buyers. I said, that sounds really great. Uh, what's the pay? And he gave me some figure for the week, some minimal figure. And I called him the next day. I said, you know, I'm really looking forward to starting at AFM next week. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I changed my mind. Uh, I'm going to use somebody in-house to do it. And all of a sudden, I don't know where this next sentence came from, but it flew out of my mouth before I checked it, checked anything, you know, that was coming. It's like, woo. And then I said, uh, well, you can't do that. Look, I've already been brushing up on my past tense in French and Spanish, and I've uh, already been in touch with buyers around the world to let them know I'll be there to present your films. Well, that was a little bit of a uh, little white lie. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, and plus, I'd be happy to just work. Oh, no. And he said, well, then you can just work on commission then. I said, no problem. Here we go again, right? So I, I went down to the film market, convinced him to get me my badge. I, he wasn't going to pay for the badge. I said, listen, how am I going to get to the other floors at AFM and get the buyers away from the other distributors into your booth if I don't have a badge to get there? So he sort of had this perplexed look, and he said, OK, I'll get you a badge. So then within four of the seven days of the American film market, I had sold out all his movies around the world. 
and uh, there were still many days left, and he had nothing left to sell. So he said, get your passport in order. You're coming to uh, Italy for the next film market, which was MeFed, which has now been sort of replaced by AFM, because AFM moved the date to compete with it. But right now, I was looking, when I was looking online last night, I was reminded there were panels going on that I would normally be speaking at at MIPCOM, which is in south of France. So that's going on. But instead, I'm here at Digital Hollywood. But uh, so I, I think what I wanted to get to was just that uh, after I, uh, at, toward the end of that first film market, that distributor said, just think. Oh, because, sorry, I forgot to tell you the best part. So the commissions ended up being uh, three times more than that fee that he was going to pay me that he removed, remember, when he was taking away the job? <laughs> so I made three times as much money working on the commission. So he said, just think how much money you'd make if you had 10 film distributors like me to represent. I was like, whoop, light bulb. So I made appointments to meet with all 350 of them, figuring that I would get a lot of no's probably, but I only needed 10 yeses. So out of 350 existing distributors at the time, I had a chance to, to make 10, right? So my goal was by Cannes Film Festival. So that's what I had then achieved was by Cannes Film Festival uh, that following several months later, I had uh, 10 film distributors. And for a decade, I went around the world to the film market selling the license rights to movies into the countries only to find out that producers were having a huge problem because there was a disconnect. They did not understand international distribution and what that entailed. They did not understand the buyer in Germany from RTL who buys for TV, internet, uh, cable, uh, movie theaters. They didn't understand how those contracts work. They didn't understand when they placed a film with a distributor in Los Angeles, what that distributor's job really was, what was happening then. And so, there was a whole area, a whole niche that, that was there that I took uh, advantage of essentially by stepping in to be of service to those producers who didn't understand distribution and needed representation. So then for a decade, I was in Beverly Hills. We, had, we were at the studio lots first, then we moved to Beverly Hills. Can I hold we, you for a second? Because yeah, sure. I want to take lessons from each part of this story. Look at what she's doing. She finds a problem Almost by mistake, right? Most of us do. We, we just come across, we're out. I mean, I think when I came across Expert Dojo, I was in a bar. And I thought, and I was meeting all these entrepreneurs, and like, everybody's failing. I'd meet them, and then they disappear. And it was almost like children of the corn for entrepreneurs. Like six months later, they're just, they're gone, right? Somebody sent them into the field, and they never come back again. And I thought, wow, there's something like weird here. Nobody's talking about the failure rate within. But I found it by mistake. And then you mull on it for a while, and you think it's a problem. And then you go, okay, cool. Now I'm going to work on building my influence level in this space where there is a problem because I need to be valuable as part of the solution to try and do that. So exactly what Paige is talking about. So then what does she do next? She finds the people who are most affected by this problem. Now, you're not hearing anything about... Well, actually, so. they found me. They found me. So they would come to me. But how did those 200 people... First, you found that one person. That one person well, that, came from the last one person that you were asked. Well, what happened was when I was at a film... And then you lied film, to him I, I was, blatantly. Oh, no, you're talking about the distributor. Yeah. yeah. No, so the <laughs> distributor who I sold the movies for... Uh, he, uh, years, A couple of years later... When I was at a film market, what happened was the producers noticed that I had relationships with all these distributors. So they started to come to me and say, hey, you know, I have a film, I flew to Cannes, I found out I had to pay $1,000 to get a badge to even move around in Cannes, not to mention my flight and my hotel, and I'm here because I, uh, I sold a film and I can't get paid by the distributor. And my wife says she'll divorce me if I don't uh, make money back on this film. We mortgaged the house, that sort of thing. So um, can you help me? And I would say, well, who negotiated your deal? And he'd say, well, my cousin's brother's son just finished real estate law school. And uh, you know, we had him do the contract. And I would say, oh. And I would have a look at the contract. And, you know, I'm not a lawyer, though I often felt like I was because a big part of my job was dealing with contracts. Uh, however, I understood what can, practically speaking, happen on the field. 
So, hey, Susan, don't record with my phone because it's, I don't have enough space on there. Thanks, sorry. Um, so, what it, it was, uh, what, what you're referring to, though, is definitely there was a need that was identified. And I think with Expert Dojo, it's the same thing. There's uh, many needs being identified, and you're guiding them. This is what I love about Expert Dojo, and this is why I want to make this transition to work with you, because I've been pitched thousands and thousands of films. And I'm not saying I don't still get intrigued, because trust me, this morning when I turned on the, uh, the YouTube to listen to people speak, there was a woman who documented her plight when she left Syria, so that, that there'd be a first-hand uh, account of the experience of a refugee versus some of the crap that's coming out by journalists who have never had the experience and never will, okay? And I thought, oh, I'm getting pulled back into my love, right? Because that's the kinds of films that I did. We did everything from Inside Iraq, which was a civilian that printed up a phony press pass at Kinko's and embedded himself in the front lines of the, the war to get an unbiased view, to Juvies, a, a, a movie that was very hard to make. Uh, Mark Wahlberg narrated it. Uh, and uh, John Densmore from The Doors and his wife, Leslie Neal, got into the jail system in the U.S. and interviewed uh, kids that are underage that are doing double life sentences because of being a victim of their own socioeconomic backgrounds and their inability to have proper representation and the U.S. laws, which were then, uh, they went and lobbied uh, in, in, uh, in Washington and changed those laws. And as a result, one of the kids' sentences was reduced by 25 years. So my getting that film on HBO leaves a greater legacy than dollars made on bigger pictures that I repped when I was working uh, or sold when I was working for distributors who did, you know, big Hollywood movies. So I enjoyed that niche and I still have a propensity toward independent documentaries. But getting back to the dojo, what I love about the dojo, uh, because I'm a Shark Tank junkie, so when I, when I sort of left the workforce to join the play force for a couple years recently, uh, I started watching a lot of Shark Tank. And then it was like, okay, I've seen every Shark Tank. I've probably seen them twice. I know some of the sharks. It's cool. But then I met Brian, and it was like Shark Tank in real time. So I came to some of the investor uh, meetups there, and for lack of a better yeah, way to investor call festival, it. Yeah. Uh, investor festivals. And uh, I love them, not only for being able to connect with other entrepreneurs who've been successful that are there to hear the pitches, but also, I, uh, I think because I've heard so many thousands of movie pitches, it's refreshing to hear a pitch about something else that is not just an idea. I always say to Brian, can you please bring me into the, uh, not pre-revenue meetings, but guys that are actually generating revenue. <laughs> I wanna see, I, it's not that I don't like ideas at their inception, I do, but, the people that have the hustle to make any idea work pretty much are the people I'm more interested in because they're gonna be good horses to bet on because they're gonna get out there and market. And uh, the other thing I wanna touch on is, I was thinking on the way over here, it's a challenging time to wanna be successful. And the reason that I think that is because of the internet and the advent of, um, uh, people who have uh, very little power gaining a sense of power by uh, by uh, bullying uh, people online, and so anybody can be uh, faceless and uh, uh, wear the mask of the internet and write anything about anyone, and in an attempt to bring them down. And that gives them this false sense of, of power. And so that is something that uh, I very much would like to be more active in the, in the uh, mm, making a difference about. And, and uh, I'm not sure where to put my energy for that. Uh, but you just got a lot, a lot going on. But you brought up a few points that, again, yeah. I want to reinforce. Number one, once you have found your problem, 
once you have put yourself as a position, as Ryan showed you, to become an influence level or an influence within that space that you have something to offer, then don't be afraid to reach out to the big VIPs who are in that space, exactly as Paige did. She needed to find 10, went out to 200. There was no hesitation in outreaching to those 200 people. 300, 350 actually. 350 people and she found 10 straight away before anything else. Not straight away, I had to go to a few hundred meetings. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. And hear a lot of no's, and hear a lot of no's. Oh, be very careful here, I'm telling you this. <laughs> but no, look, we all know it's not easy, it's hard. But the, the challenge most people have is they don't walk down that path. The, 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 the greater conversation normally is, oh, we're just going to talk about what we're going to create and the strategy and how awesome it will be and we're going to sit on our nice sofa and we're going to make sure that everybody goes through it. But to actually go out there and do it. So you brought up that one point that I just want to embrain, I want to it, sort of put on everybody's brain when they leave out here is, I am going to go to the people who most are, who are most important to the space that I'm involved in, not the biggest people that are most important to me imminently in my space, and I am going to attack those people when I leave today, and I'm going to put in place a plan that I will consistently go after them. The other point that you brought up that I really like is that there's a million people who have got a wonderful story. And there's a million people who maybe have a, an angle to a story. But it's the really, if you can get your brand to a place that someone really cares, like Paige listening to that Syrian lady who's documenting it, she's not doing a better movie, she's not got better production, she doesn't have more directors, she doesn't have more people on it. She's got less of all of those. But she's got a story that resonates, and she's found a way to get that story out so that a random person in a different country who happens to be someone who could be tremendously important to her has heard and seen her story. So put yourself in a place outside here of realizing there is a couple of billion people on this planet. And I swear to God, no matter what you do or where you're doing it, there are people out there who really care about that particular subject and how you're impacting in it more than you do. And they want to meet you. And the question becomes, how do you actually get to that place? So I, I love that. And then so as you built the company up, you got it up and you were, you were repping just hundreds of movies by the end of it. How did you scale it beyond, even though this is zero to one, I'd be really interested to know, is like, how did you go from the, hey, it's Paige and I'm saving the world, <laughs> to, oh, shoot, I need to have a huge team of people around me to do this? Yes, yeah, so, well, it's interesting because I was uh, on vacation and I, at Christmas, New Year's, and I came back to the studio lot where I had two offices and found that the staff had departed to form their own competing company. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> and uh, so, so I had to uh, open a new, uh, I, want, I mean, I had to get a new staff, basically. And I decided to move to Beverly Hills because part of the reason I was on the studio lot was for the convenience of one of the guys running it who lived close to the studio lot and thought it would be cool to have offices on the studio lot. Anyway, I much preferred Beverly Hills because when people would come to town and want to go to lunch and whatnot, it was just much easier and there's so many choice of restaurants. So I moved to an office that I wasn't sure I could afford in Beverly Hills. And every day for the first seven days of being in that office, we signed a new film. It was uncanny. I think I had like a really lucky feng shui angle of my desk. If I look back on it now, I actually, thinking about it, because I've studied a little feng shui now that I've had more time on my hands, you know, to study different things besides people's films uh, uh, and what my next flight is. Uh, I've, I, if I think back of how that, that, uh, that desk was positioned, and Susan, you remember, because you were in that office, we, it was on the wall facing, commanding the room, but also with the view. Uh, so, we did a lot of deals in that office in Beverly Hills, and we got distribution for you know all the films that we represented, and they're still being uh, distributed around the world, and they're still on on television, and they're on Netflix. In fact, some of them are on Netflix, and uh, uh, they've managed to to be on there and somehow or another circumvent our ongoing relationship uh, for our piece of that. So whatever, but. The, uh, uh, it, it's interesting, now that, that films are making money on Netflix and places like it, 
I think that um, it, it's almost, it, it, it's tempting to want to go back into the, that repping business again just to do some more deals with these different platforms. Uh, and what I realize now in retrospect is actually, I, I saw the changes from, uh, bless you, I saw the changes from, from film to VHS, you know, to VHS disappearing, and then DVD, and then DVD disappearing, and now streaming video. So it's really not that much different. It's just a question of being able to adapt. And I, there was such a period in between where everything was in, in flex that it made it difficult to have it make sense. And the whole, all the numbers weren't, weren't making sense anymore. So it's just a, a weird time. And a lot of people uh, that couldn't adapt had to uh, step away. Uh, and you have to also know when, when to step away. But I wanted to say one thing. How many people saw the Banksy auction of the Banksy painting that shredded itself? <laughs> that was so good. So my, 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 my colleague, uh, John Sloss, got to, I remember uh, speaking on, on panels with John Sloss. Who knows John Sloss? All right, so traditional filmmaker makers would all know, would have all known him. Nobody raised their hand, it's unbelievable. So uh, he's a producer's rep in New York who's also an attorney and he's represented lots of important movies. But uh, uh, he represented Banksy's documentary uh, years ago. So Banksy, for those of you who don't happen to know, is a, a famous artist who manages to remain anonymous, who recently made history in the art world by as having one his painting sell for what was it 1.8 million or 9 million something like that at auction and as soon as the gavel de went down within seconds the frame became a shredder and it shredded the painting that was just purchased and so then there was the question of um, would the buyer still buy the be responsible for that 1.8 or 9 million and speculators in the art world said the, the painting was actually worth double now that it went through a shredder. <laughs> so she did go through with the purchase. Uh, but what I love about Banksy, I wish there was a way to be successful as a film rep or something like what I've been doing with be com completely anonymously. Be because uh, again, with the advent of bullies online, it's like I don't care what you gain popularity in, whether you're a painter, a producer, a uh, yeah, an inventor of uh, a life-saving device, uh, uh, a new drug, uh, uh, a toothbrush that brushes the up and the down at the same time, like the guy I met. I don't care who you are uh, uh, or what you've invented or what you're doing. There are all these bullies online who are gonna criticize you and you have to have a stomach for that. Not everybody has that. It would be really cool to be able to achieve enormous success for more people in the way that Bang C did, wouldn't it? That'd be so cool. And it's good, and you've been able to do that through filmmaking, which is really nice as well. I mean, we can even see it with, um, I don't know if anybody's seen the new Netflix designated survivor. You've seen it? Like, it's just really interesting how, through what you do, you can just change that whole, that, that whole. So now, in Designated Survivor, the president is this kind, beautiful, generous, kind-hearted man who just adores the world and wants to make it a better place and fights against anything that could possibly be against women. Or, and it's just, it's really, it's very really interesting how you can subtly come in and create that conversation. I've got one last question, and Dustin, can you come up here? And Ryan and Sean, do you mind coming back up here as well? Um, we're going to bring Justin, we're going to just talk about bot, um, chatbots and technology, and then we're going to open it up for questions afterwards, right? My question is this, is the future of entertainment as you see it. So we've got some really phenomenal companies through the dojo. I see Alessandra has just come in the back from Shipsomnia, which is all about how do you take what would have been traditionally cruises and actually turn them into mini chapters and small series create by uh, producers, really famous producers like Ridley Scott, who now she's now working with on that side too. How do you see the future of entertainment within movies? Do you see it along those types of lines or something different? Well, I don't, I don't know that I'm a good predictor of the future, but uh, I think that with respect to the future, it does, it does make me think of something uh, that I did want to share today, which is an exercise that I challenge you all to do. And that is to write a letter to yourself today from the future. 
So in 10 years from now, what you would be writing back to yourself today about where you've come 10 years from now. And similarly to when you went to uh, school or college, and you would, you would set forth what you, would, what you want to graduate with, you would have to look back and say, okay, what courses do I need to take in order to graduate with, with, uh, for, in that field? So what, whatever it is that you want, or you, you can imagine, it, it's an exercise in order to imagine the future and wh where you've arrived at. And then from there, to be able to work backwards and take a look at uh, what you need to do to get there. And, uh, and I don't mean just uh, practically speaking. I mean, what does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it look like? Uh, how are you within that space? Uh, of your life, and uh, and so, uh, but as far as as film, I just see uh, more uh, digital media, and and as far as theater, uh, I mean more um, streaming, more uh, uh, more of the Hulu's and other uh, competitors in that space, and then also uh, um, uh, the theater experience is going to have to be turned into something as unique as what, what we've been talking about with Ship's Omnia, because uh, when, when you go to a theater and, and you want to be expected to pay a great deal of money to see a movie, you know, it's going to have to be more of an experience. I personally love the lay-down theaters where you can eat something. Not that I like any of the food much on there, but maybe they'll improve that. And so the whole experience of, of uh, sort of being in the theater and... Uh, uh, I think that's going to have to be creatively improved upon, and uh, yeah, I, I mean like the millennium, millennium. I like it though, more, like more experiential. Yeah. I do. I like that letter to yourself in the future. It works much better in America than in Ireland. Like <laughs> with like repressed Catholic Irish people, we write a letter to ourselves saying, "I am so disappointed in you. <laughs> you, you. You have been. Your life has been a miserable, terrible failure, and every and every member of your family despises you. And you should feel guilty forever." But we have the church to That's thank for that. That's not what your letter would say. Your letter probably said, I'll be in America, had you written your letter. It would, and I'd be surrounded by beautiful people who I love. Hey, um, so thank you very much, Paige. She's not going anywhere. Um, I, I want to I wanna kick into technology for 10 minutes and really talk about some methodologies that you can use to help your businesses go forward. Who here knows about chatbots uh, on a level of 10 out of 10? 5 out of 10? couple of fives, maybe one or two. Okay, good. So not many people know about chatbots, which is really good. I, um, I like to think of myself as an older person, right? I've been around for like 20, 30 years in the workforce. I grew up like, like, like Paige, you know, as internet came in, emails came in, my favorite form of communication is emails. And I like to veer towards the things which I'm most comfortable at. But I also look at everything which is new and is upcoming in any space at any time. And I know that there's no kid, including mine, that's not using messenger, text, or finding some kind of short form way of communicating with each other. Now, when you have that that's happening on such a massive rate, i.e., everybody, and we're not using that form of communication ourselves, we're missing out on something. So, Dustin is the CEO of Chatbot. Chatbot are one of the leading chatbot companies and, and uh, development companies here in LA. Um, I want to just get some information from him as much as I can shove down your throat on how, what type of communication platforms are evolving and why that's going to be important to you as far as developing your message, your personal brand. Welcome, Dustin. Tell us a little bit more about what I'm talking about here. Yeah, so I got really involved in the space about two years ago. Um, it was, uh, before that, I was working full-time with Brian, a uh, partner at Expert Dojo, but was really fascinated with a lot of the startup companies trying to get into the space and figure it out um, uh, from a writing standpoint. So the company is actually called Bot Copy, um, and kind of going to the, the zero to one mentality, um, I saw a really interesting space starting to evolve with AI and, and, and chat communication between um, consumers and being able to leverage your business on multiple platforms. So not just your website, not just Facebook, not just Alexa, um, OK Google, um, which is Google Assistant as well. But be able to place yourself 
uh, or your business wherever they are. Um, and I saw the, the market opportunity was um, very techy, but it was a lot of engineers coding these conversations, but the writing behind it was, um, was, wasn't that great, at least in my opinion. And I'd always ask myself when playing around with Siri and Alexa, you know, who gets to write this? You know, for a living, like who who are they hiring to? Hang on. So take us down to a, to a base level. <clears throat> I'm expert dojo. Yeah. I want to create messaging for everybody here, so okay. everybody's feeling warm and fuzzy about Brian. Like, mm -hmm. what would physically happen? Are we talking about creating something like in our, inside our phone when we're doing text, or is it on our website? And, and what does it do? You'd be a pretty hard guy to replicate. <laughs> the Irish accent in the chatbot just doesn't. That's all you know. I got. <laughs> I got nothing. But else. We, we often laugh, like when uh, we're in the office, about. Um, uh, I don't know if, if, if anybody's. Uh, is anybody in sales here? Has anybody read a transcript? Like a, a sales transcript when they're answering calls at like a call center? Um, today, most of that stuff should be automated. You know, the fact that humans are reading a script is just kind of bizarre. Um, so we look at those types of things. Um, calls that are being recorded for quality purposes are usually a good place to start as well. So you got to look at what, what current systems in place. So if you're having a con like conversation with a customer, whether that's answering a phone call, um, there's, there's repetitive conversations that you have in your business. And usually you start there. Um, and, and I like it. Like, so, like, for example, we have an accelerator, and we have a bunch of people who apply for the accelerator. Yeah. Uh, like, what are your frequently asked questions? Yeah, so, so, for example, and a lot of the time, we used to take those manually, and they would come through, and we'd go, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm looking to start a business. Oh, you want to start a business? How much do you want? Where are you going? But all that stuff can be automated. And not only can it be automated, like, we can send them directly to the application forms without anybody having to get involved. Mm -hmm. So it's a touch area of the business. And I think all of you have touch areas like this, where it's not 100% of your business to Dustin's point. It's not about replacing you in every conversation that you do, but it's about taking all of the inefficiencies that you have within your current communication models and then saying what kind of predictive um, chat can we build in so that your customer can get access to, to, um, to answers very, very quickly. Yeah, and, and you can make them fun. You know, we, we like to take a look at different personality types and, and really understand you know, your user base. So the most direct feedback you're going to get uh, about your product or your business is, is a conversation with people who are trying to purchase something from you. Um, and, and having a chatbot gives you the ability to look at those conversations and actually make something of them. You know, take your product in the direction that people are wanting. Um, and having it analyzed and look at that and actually learn from some of those conversations is where it starts to get really interesting. Um, and then the ability for them to exist in, in more native areas where your consumer base is, especially with even younger, like Gen Z and um, m m like millennials. You know, we, we're not going to your website necessarily and we're not trying to figure out what you do because every website looks different, so that's just a learning curve for every you know, person to go onto the website, try to navigate what, what's being offered. Um, when a conversation just pretty natural for most people to pick up. And, say, and I'll hey, tell you why this is cool. There's only two objections that you can have to any of the stuff we're talking about today, zero to one, which is just sell, 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 sell. Right, the first one is, I can't do it, Brian. Right, which is, which is a learning and a skills um, uh, objection to overcome. But the second one is, dude, there's only one of me. Like you're saying, reach out to 300 people, deal with partners, deal with influencers, deal with all these people. There's only one of me. When you start integrating chatbots and automated responses into some of your communication with the people that matter, then when you do that, you get to a place where actually there's not only one of you. There's 20 of you, 50 of you, 100 of you, 200 of you. Like you can multiply yourself and the outreach that you can do on a huge level. So, okay, here's the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. For people on a budget, super tight budget, how do, they, how do you suggest they start? Is there something that they can do themselves to like do a mini baby little chatbot which has got five or 10 questions answered on it? Yeah, um, best place to start is through FAQs. You know, we, we usually have a good grasp on what our FAQs are, like right out of the gates, and, and starting to figure out not only how to answer them, but 
you know, what's the goal in answering them? So if the, the frequently asked questions, just if, for if, if, if the question for Expert Dojo is, um, you know, what programs do you guys offer? And then we show them the program, and there's no response. Then the chatbot could also say, um, you know, what's your business? Maybe I can help you out. Like, pick a better program that's more fitting for you based on what everybody else does. Yeah, because it frequently asked, even if you go to our website and frequently ask questions, it's kind of boring. Like, uh, is your, what do you do? You raise money? Yeah, we raise money. Uh, are you looking to try and do this? No, we're not trying to do this. So you can build a whole conversation in there as well. But how do they actually go and build something on their website and make sure that they've got a, um, I don't know, can they build a chatbot themselves? A yeah, basic so one? There's, uh, I mean, obviously for a detailed one, Bot Copy are one, of, are one of the top development companies in the United States, right? But I'm talking about somebody who's got like 50 bucks and they think, can I build something on my website and put it there? Yes. Uh, there's companies like uh, Drift and Intercom, um, if you're do looking just for website, um, that do focus more on live chat um, functionality, but it's okay because then you can look at those live chat tr um, transcripts and, and start to figure out you know, and automating those pieces. So if you're looking at Facebook Messenger, um, an easy one to build on is ChatFuel. Um, if you're looking at more of a robust enterprise solution where you want to... But they can do chat, so they can go to ChatFuel, F-U-E-L, and if they go on that platform, they can build their own little basic... It's like a MailChimp. Beautiful, right? For AI. For and they can do it on their website? They can build it into Facebook? Um, so for Chatfield, you can only use Facebook. If you want to use, if you want to have like your own personal branded login um, and experience, whether it's a robust experience or really simple, um, we have a plugin that's pretty much free for anybody at, at, at botcopy.com that you can do that with. Um, we found that a lot of clients, like even though Facebook's... Can you build it into your dating profile? I, I see a lot That's of a saved question. time for a lot of people here looking for love. I know we're moving away from zero to one, but I just see a huge Maybe problem. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tested some of our automatic responses on, on like Tinder and Bumble and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so anybody so who can. finds, anyone who <laughs> finds Dustin on Tinder and Bumble, <laughs> you're actually speaking to his chatbot. Awesome. <laughs> Expect a relationship beyond your wildest dreams. <laughs> it's great when it, like, my schedule just populates. Hey, you, you know, you have a date. Like, oh. Schedule the time. <laughs> what a, what a if I could chirp in for a second, I've had the pleasure of working with Dustin, and he's built my chat bot. And her name is Gingybot. G-I-N-G-Y bot. You can go say hi to her and you can have a conversation. What I think is one of the, the starting things that you can do right now is figure out what the conversation will be. And that's something that Dustin really helped me out with. I said, I wanted to do 10 things. And he's like, well, what are the top two? And so even that was a good exercise. And he uses the words conversation design. And as you saw in my permission-based pitching, you can take a guess at a decision tree matrix of what happens in a real conversation. And going through that process, mapping out, if someone were to have a question, what question would they ask? And what would I say? And what might they reply? And then what might I reply to that? Going through that thought process, I believe, is the foundational value of having a bot. So for with, with me, when I'm speaking on a large stage, uh, all speakers are trying to figure out how you can connect with somebody afterwards. I, I've got some cards. You can come say hi to me afterwards. Uh, there's all these kind of old school but non-efficient ways. And so I'm working towards the ability of saying, if you want to get in touch with me, go through my assistant. Her name is Gingybot. Yes, she is a bot. And what happens is that in that decision tree, somebody says hi to Gingybot, she comes back, she's kind of uh, sassy and funny, and then she helps to determine if you need help with personal branding, if you need help with communication, or if you want to work with me directly. And that helped me to establish what my funnel is. If they want to learn about personal branding, they can click on a button and get 30 days of emails of my stick figure drawings, of which I'm able to give them drawings, give them podcasts, give them content in a very drip situation. And at the end of it, I can say, if you want to learn more, here's a course. So I like to think of it as your silent salesperson. Anybody in consumer goods, it's about what does the display look like? So for me, a good thought process, whether you have 50 bucks or 5,000 invested in it, see if you can map out what that conversation would look like. And that is of huge value because at the end of the day, it's designing your funnel. That's how I would look at it. 
Okay, and so we've got, I think, what, a minute or two left? Minus a minute or two left? Minus a minute or two left. Awesome. Okay, so I want to push to the question, but I do want to say, Nico, you need a chatbot. You have tens of thousands of people coming onto your website every single month, if not hundreds of thousands of people. They all care about superhero. They all care about the Marvel figures that you pull together and everything else as well. Like, so those people, you look at the amount of people who are actually buying something on your site, and then you look at the amount of people that you're losing on the site, and you think, is there a middle place where we can create a conversation with those people and get them engaged? So, Because, Ryan, this is all about increasing uh, conversion, right, and increasing the conversation with your customers. Yeah, and, and Dustin was someone who I asked a very specific question. I said, Dustin, why do I need a bot? And he said something like, <laughs> he convinced me. I was on the fence. And so I think that there's this idea of having I, a bot I actually or not. like Ryan's bot more than I like Ryan. That's the truth. It's fair kind enough, of a fair guilty enough. Well, I am frantic. I, I am frantic. You understand. <laughs> but seriously, uh, I, think, I think a good question when it comes to this bot, why would someone have a bot? To bot... Oh. Or not? We, I actually have a, <laughs> that is the question. I have a blog post called to bot or not. Uh -huh. um, I, at the end of the day, it's, it's time. You know, saving time and getting a better understanding of your customers and, and allocating what you learn from them towards the different wings of your corporation. You know, we, had, we had a client, um, Redbox, and I spoke with their marketing team and pitched just this incredible chatbot for their marketing team. It's like predictive analysis that's going to give people what movies they should watch based on their moods, if they're going to date, things like that. Like, I thought it was amazing. They passed on it. But then I had a call with the COO of, of Redbox, and he's like, what else can you guys do? And I, it was like a, a shit moment. And um, I said, well, What's, what's the number one question that you're spending on your call center? He's like, uh, disc scratched. Our, our, you know, our disc is scratched. How do I solve this issue? I was like, oh, well, how long on average does it take to handle that in the call center? And like four minutes and 32 seconds. And I was like, oh, shit. This, I know. This, this is this guy's job to know these numbers. I'm going to keep quizzing him. <laughs> and I was like, how many minutes a day? He's like, 43,000. I was like, oh my gosh, you're spending over $3 million on a scratch disc issue? You need a chatbot. Yeah, so just find out what your scratch disc is. So look, rather than doing loads of questions here in front of it, of course, as always, I always run out of time because everybody's so damn interesting and I talk way too much, uh, which, no. which, Brian, which Brian, will, Ryan will scourge me on later on. But look, <laughs> everybody's going to hang around for like 15 or 20 minutes, right? And we'll all be, uh, what time is the next panel starting at? Well, don't we have another 15 minutes then for like Q&A where well, you just need to warm up the room? I got to go to the next Yeah, I, I don't want to mess with Okay, you're right. It's my bad. I'm pushing. Do we have time for a few questions or no? Okay, cool. We got a few questions. <laughs> if you keep asking, what do you, got? you will <laughs> convince her that you do. Yeah, yeah, it's actually Ill illegal in the state of California now to. The question, the question was uh, essentially, do you can you, do you have to identify that you're a robot? And in the in the state of California, you do. So, if if we do deal with IVR systems on phone calls, we we don't do as much of them, um, but we try to make it obvious right out the gates that you're speaking with a digital agent. Yeah, yeah. There, oh. there's, recent, there's recent news. He's saying the interaction is negative, but the technology is getting to the point where sometimes, or, or at least soon, you won't be able to notice. And out of China, there's some statistics showing that they're using voice chatbots to try to collect debt, and those voice chatbots are outperforming humans. And the, so there, are, there was recently something that went out online where there was a real conversation and a bot and a real conversation that Google put out, and you literally couldn't tell the difference because they're pausing and they're using ums and, and they are humanistic. So eventually it'll get to a point. But if you're irritated with it right now, it's because it's not a good, it's, it, it's not a written well. Do you, do you find it irritating sitting on the phone on hold, listening to the hold music for a really long time? 
Yeah, so this is about relevance. I think your point worse. is a super point. I got two calls this morning from automated people trying to sell me stuff that I don't want, right? So your point is more about relevance than anything else. Right now, it's like clumsy. It's like a, um, I don't know, a kid on a date, right? And what it needs to do is it needs to mature to a place whereby everything is super relevant. I don't want to stay on the phone to the Bank of America for 25 minutes because they don't open on weekends anymore because they've cut back on it. And um, when I could actually get the answer in a short period of time, but if I do need a human, I want to get direct access to that human in seconds. But it's a, it's a great point. I want to take some more questions real quick. What else have we got? Yeah. Over to Paige, yep. So the point is that, there's, that she has a belief that YouTube is going to skyrocket over Netflix and a lot of the subscription services that are out there currently producing. So videos. my other neighbor, when I was walking the dog this morning, she works at YouTube doing those annoying ads, some of which you can skip and some you can't skip. She educated me on that, which I will save for another time. But she said that they just uh, launched uh, YouTube TV. So there will be acquisitions for product uh, for YouTube TV. She wasn't sure where they were going to be based yet, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if they'll end up in my neighborhood. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's fascinating, all, all these uh, new, new platforms. I think my next study is just going to be, I mean, how many, know, how many people in here know a filmmaker or a content creator that's really hit the jack part a pot on one of those platforms, and can you tell us which which one they made? Which pro, which? Uh, yeah, go ahead. What is it? <laughs> it's the, it's the show about sunglasses. And they made a lot of and money. And spray painting them. He's got like a hundred million followers. Right. How have they done? Okay. So I okay. know I have a so, so I have a theory on so uh, on these particular channels. So Casey, for example, was a very early adopter on YouTube. He got in there right at the start. For, hmm? That was what? No, no, no. He's been on YouTube for years and adopter, years and years. Adopter, adopter. Yeah. Adopter. He's an early adopter, yeah. Uh, so he's been on there for an awful long time. My personal feeling is if you try to get onto YouTube right now, you're wasting your time. It's too late. The train is gone. It left five years ago. The people who got in at the start, all you needed to have was a bloody kitten up a tree and you were going to get but, 20 but million followers. But who you want to get to know is no, no, who's going to be acquisition, yeah. head of acquisitions and the new TV uh, division of YouTube, they're going to be and licensing I'm not, and I'm, films for TV. I'm not disagreeing at yeah. all. What I was just going to say was, look, there are, you've got to decide what you want to get from it, right? So if you're looking for a new audience and it's a millennial audience and they're, and they're young kids, go to Twitch. It's like brand new. It's just out. Like you can get huge amounts of followers. I know people whose followers are blowing up. If you're going to go to YouTube, expect to pay for your audience. Ty Lopez did it incredibly successfully, but he was paying, you know, as Betsy and other people know, he was paying a tremendous amount of money to get in there at the start. Just decide what you're trying to achieve and then build an ROI into it. But you're not wrong. In the same way that Facebook are absolutely terrified right now of losing market share and they're becoming a massive content producer and going into the same place. Place, YouTube are thinking the same, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's just fascinating that all these places are forming their own divisions to acquire films, and then it's or or uh, episodic shows. And the interesting thing about it is what hasn't changed again is the execution of that content, the quality of your story that you're telling, the performances, the direction. Those things are not being replaced by robots, you know. And it, it's true creativity and talent and blood, sweat, and tears and a commitment to execute a, a beautifully crafted uh, piece. That's still, that's the same conversation we were having in the 90s. Yeah. It's just a different cast, a different director, or maybe some of the same. There's crossover, too, in, in these platforms. Okay, before I get voted as worst moderator ever, last question. Very last one, and then I'm leaving. Okay. What you got?
Yeah, and I'll echo that comment. She was basically saying that the more she let the potential employer talk, the better off she was. And if you think about the last great conversation you had, chances are you were the one doing the talking. There's also studies that show there's a direct correlation between the amount of time someone talks in a conversation is directly correlated to their positive emotions and feelings about the person they're talking to. So if you want to be a good salesperson, if you want to be a good lover, if you want to be all these things, it's all relationship-based. Set them up, listen, and the trick is to give that pause. Don't jump. Meow. Yes. Silence is your most powerful tool. The one thing you can choose is the amount of time that you take before you choose to speak. Oh my God! Okay, now that There's my heart is trembling really with the words, of you, okay, you want to ask something? Ask her really Look quick. Into my eyes. Pitch anything by Oren Clef. We're all going down the line. Um, I, I recently read this book called Crossing the Chasm. Yeah, we Sean crossing, also crossing referenced the chasm, yeah. as well. Uh, lean Startup. Yeah, I hate Lean Startup. But, <laughs> but I hate it. But, but it's got some really cool stuff in there as well. Uh, I'm, I'm going for, I love Simon Sinek, uh, The Art of Why. I think he's awesome. It's all about brand and building beautiful brand. Oh God, I have too many running through my head. Everything from Lean In to Rich Dad Poor Dad to the book that I'm gonna write one of these days. That's it. My Takeover of the Universe by <laughs> Paige Ostro. Okay, look, can we have a huge round of applause? I didn't get a huge round of applause for Paige. Can we have like a massive one for Paige? Uh, big thank you for Sean. Big thank you for Dustin and for my great friend, Mr. Ryan Foland over there. Thank you to all of you. You're all amazing. And hopefully you got great content. And most importantly, everybody go here today. Please take an action. Do something that's going to drive your business forward. Thank you.